Hey, it's Mallory. Exciting news. I'm hosting the Engage Summit in Raleigh on June 25th and 26th, and I'd love to meet you there. Together, we'll dive into the mind of the modern student, what fires them up, how they interact, and what they expect in today's digital age, and how tools like AI help put them in the driver's seat of their education. We have some terrific speakers, including our closing keynote, New York Times bestselling author Jeff Salingo. Sessions will dig into practical ideas and innovative strategies to get your team more student-centered and ready to adopt AI. And many of your favorite Enrollify hosts are presenting too, like Jamie Hunt, Jenny Lee Fowler, and Brian Gross. Use the discount code Enrollify50 for an extra $50 off your registration. Learn more and register at engage.element451.com. We can't wait to see you there. Welcome to The Application, the go-to, how-to podcast for higher education marketers. I'm your host, Allison Tercio, Assistant Vice President of Enrollment and Marketing at Siena College. Whether you're a seasoned pro or just starting out, this podcast is packed with practical tips and actionable advice to help you elevate your marketing game. In each snackable episode, we bring in experts to share their insights and experience on the topics that matter most to you. Got a question or idea you'd like us to cover? Email team at enrollify.org or reach out to me on Twitter or LinkedIn. The application is part of the Enrollify Podcast Network. And if you like this show, you'll definitely want to check out our other higher ed focused podcasts on admissions, tech, marketing, and more. They're packed with stories, ideas, and tools to help you be the best in your field. All right, it's time for the show. Hi, everyone. Today's episode is all about one of my favorite topics, content marketing. We're joined by Brian Piper, a leading figure in content marketing and director of content strategy and assessment at University of Rochester. Welcome, Brian. Thank you so much, Allison. It's great to be on here. You know, you've been doing content marketing and you've been an expert in this area for a very, very long time. So can you start by telling us about your experience with content marketing and just why it's so important for our industry? Yeah. So I I mean, I actually started off as a website developer back in 1996. I wasn't a, a very talented or very satisfied website developer, but I was working with a very talented team. So they would often just put me on the content side of things. So I would optimize the content for search, spend some time at an ad agency. And then in 2014, I read the first edition of Epic Content Marketing and was like, this is what I want to do. I can, you know, sell things and convince people to know, like, and trust us just by telling stories and by putting out content that's helpful. So I went right down to the vice president of our marketing department and said, You need to hire me to be your digital marketing manager. She said, we don't have that position. I said, (laughs) we need that position. (laughs) So, you know, within the first six months, I was able to double our organic traffic and then really was able to start leveraging more content marketing specifically to focus on our products and our sales and our relationships with our customers. And that led me into the position at the university. And since joining the university, I've kind of done the same thing, focusing initially on just, you know, SEO and optimization from data, but then really trying to to turn things towards audience first content. And that led me into speaking at a lot of content and higher ed conferences and trying to spread that message as much as possible. What would you say the status of content marketing is in higher ed right now? As I was researching the latest book and talking to lots of different higher ed marketers, I was surprised that one of the most difficult questions for people to answer was who's doing content marketing well in higher ed. And I think part of the problem was just, you know, I was talking to all these marketing leaders for their institutions. So they don't, they're not the target audience for a lot of this content. So there is content marketing going on in the higher ed space. But I think, I mean, even 
Like within the last 10 years, the need for marketing in higher ed has started to grow. And a lot of times, you know, especially bigger institutions didn't see marketing as something that they needed because they had their brand and people needed to go to college. And now we're seeing that that's not the case anymore. So it's becoming more and more important for us to figure out better ways to market ourselves. And content marketing is really the perfect fit for higher ed. I mean, we have stories. If there's one thing we have, we have stories and we have right? experts, right? <laughs> yes, absolutely. And I mean, content marketing has been around for, you know, centuries from, you know, Ben Franklin and John Deere and, you know, they're putting out helpful content. And as a, like a term, as a coined phrase, it's, you know, been growing for the last 10 years and, and brands are, you know, adopting this quickly and using this and seeing the value. But higher ed institutions are just starting to realize that they have so many stories and our entire mission is to transfer knowledge and to help people. So why not marry those together and help tell those stories while adding value to our audiences, whether or not they end up choosing to come to our school, at least we are a valuable resource that they're going to remember, you know, down the, yeah. down the road. So were you able to find the answer to your question? Who is doing this well and, and what are they doing? Yes, I was able to find <laughs> like really good case studies. Um, so like one of the featured case studies is Purdue. And, you know, they've won all sorts of awards for their content marketing and they've really changed, you know, it really centralized their marketing a lot more from an institutional standpoint and really focusing on telling those stories and reaching those specific audiences and aligning those stories with their institutional strategies, being very intentional about, you know, creating that connection, mapping out their calendar, identifying different working groups that they have focusing on different areas and for different audiences. But, you know, along with the big case studies like that, there are also Lots of little case studies and and little examples throughout the book, like the uh, college application boot camp that you do at Siena, where yeah. you create all this valuable content for potential undergraduates and you offer all these services at no charge with no expectations, hoping that it's going to be helpful for them whether or not they end up choosing your college. Yeah, and they do. It does work, yes. <laughs> right? So some of them, some of them put through and were we're able to live our brand by doing that because it's really about access to education and, and being inclusive in education. So I think that colleges that can find, like your example with Purdue, they're not just doing it, they're doing it in a Purdue way. Exactly. They're doing it the Purdue way. They're doing it in a way that's really on brand for them and their mission. And I think that's what probably is the recipe for success when it comes to content marketing. We're always talking about, you know, how do you differentiate and that brand voice and, you know, creating that persona for your institution so that everything comes out consistent, everything has the same messaging and that people really understand, you know, what they're connecting with when they select your institution. It's a huge, huge impact on the effectiveness of your content marketing. So on the, on the flip side, so those are some examples of People who have gotten it, they're working it, they're doing the content marketing. On the flip side, what are some of the common mistakes that we might see people making when it comes to content marketing efforts? And how can we help them avoid those mistakes? Yeah, and I think, you know, one of the biggest issues that most anyone doing content marketing, whether it's a, a higher ed or a brand, is that they just don't see it as... You know, they see it as a campaign. They don't see it as a strategy, yeah. long-term investment in your content as an asset. And you have to continually and consistently put content out that's going to be helpful, that's going to be useful without thinking about it as, okay, we did that one thing. We put out that piece of content, check that box and move on to something else. It's really a long-term plan because what content marketing is, is it's forming a relationship. It's creating that connection with your audience and getting someone to know, like, and trust you through your content. And as we know, any sort of relationship building takes time. It's not a quick, yeah. not, it's not something yeah. you can just go out and do and suddenly you're best friends with somebody. You have to build that. You have to grow that. So that's the biggest thing is 
looking at that as a long-term commitment and really integrating it into your strategy? Well, if you want to use, go back to the college boot camp that we do at Siena for a second to talk about how long-term. So we do that at the start of a summer, so June, July, and we can't really know the putt through and the effectiveness until census day, the following fall. So we're talking almost a year and a half later, right? And also, of course, you can't just do that and then all of a sudden switch to a different kind of mindset with how you're relationship building with people, right? You you set the tone and that's how you're going to approach them and that's how you're going to communicate with them. So it is it is a really long process. It's not a one and done. You can't develop one webinar, one ebook and wipe your hands all set. Good. I put it up on the website. So you yeah. think, do you think that's where we mostly go wrong here is we, we make some good content and we put it up there and we expect it to be some kind of silver bullet. We don't attend to it. We don't attend to the relationships that result from it. Yes, absolutely. And, and it's really a mind shift of beginning to think about your content as as an asset, this is value. Your content has value. And I think, you know, what you said about creating that authentic message is critical because if you try to present something to students and then they show up at your campus and that's not what they find, that's going to have a negative impact on you. So you want to be transparent, you want to be authentic, and you want to be consistent. Well, and I think too, it's tempting to be focusing your time, energy, and your budget on more the brand marketing and the performance marketing, right? It's so tempting to be really forefront with the things you want to say about your institution. And this forces you to do that, put that in the back seat. Right, absolutely. And and let other things highlight what your brand stands for. So I think that's really difficult struggle for people in a position, especially if they have limited funding. Absolutely. And, and, you know, traditional marketing is pushing information about yourself to your audience. And very few audiences actually want that. Um, mm-hmm. And the great thing about content marketing is in a lot of cases, I mean, not only are you providing information that's helpful to them, but you can take it a step further and actually have those people tell those stories. So you're having students talk to, you know, potential students about what they like about their campus uh, and what they like about their experience and how it's helping them. And then you get alumni to show how that experience has changed their life or created new opportunities for them. But it's not the institution telling other people why they should come to our school. And what role does data play in all of this? Data can You know, it it basically comes into every part of the content process. Mm -hmm. And it's really how you manage to stay audience focused. So like everything from the creation of content to figure out what content you should be making, what's working, what isn't, what channels are performing better, which audiences like consuming content on which channel Every place that you create content, there is data to help guide you as far as what you should be doing. Because if we're creating content without a strategy or creating content without looking at our data, we're wasting our time. And time is our most valuable asset as as marketers and as people. What data do you find most valuable as a content marketer? I'm going to guess it's a mix of qualitative and quantitative, but what do you look for? What what do you find the most valuable? Well, it depends on what your goals are. So, you know, obviously starting with your goals and with your uh, strategic priorities is the most essential part of, uh, before you ever think about data or before you ever think about content, you have to know what you're going or where you're going and what you're trying to accomplish. And then next, you have to know who specifically you're talking to, like which audience can help you reach those goals. Then you're going to get into, you know, specifically now, what are the KPIs? What measurements are you looking for? So if you're just trying to build brand awareness, then you can look at like those vanity metrics, like, you know, page views and time on page. But if you're looking at enrollment, increasing enrollment, then you're going to look at conversions, you're going to look at requests for visits, you're going to look at uh, applications. So it's really connecting the 
data to the goal to figure out whether or not you're making progress on your journey. But one of my favorite things to look at is search data to understand why people are coming to your site, what they're looking for, what questions you're asking, and then to make sure that you are actually answering those questions and providing the information that they're looking for and figuring out where the gaps are in your content and looking at the user journey through your content to see where are they stopping? Where are they not moving forward in in the consumption of your content? What else could we create to fill in that spot? You have an example of data-driven content that really made a difference. You have a case study on data. Yeah. So lots of them. Um, Probably all the ones that'll be coming out in your book. (laughs) <laughs> yes, yes. The, the book is filled with, um, you know, like what I said about Google Search Console. So a lot of times whenever we start off by helping someone out with a website redesign or helping them with a content refresh, we'll open up Google Search Console. We'll look at all the questions people are a- am asking to get to their content. We'll figure out what like keyword areas they're already ranking well for. And then we'll go through and we'll figure out which ones of these are the most strategically important, which ones are being asked, you know, which topics are the most relevant to your target audience. And then we'll create more content around that. And we've seen, you know, sometimes we've seen double or triple the conversion rates on a page. Once we're answering all of those questions that users have, or we're helping point them to, you know, different solutions to problems that they're trying to figure out solutions for. I really like this approach because, again, it's not deciding what do I want to say on this web page. It's deciding what content does the audience need from this this website. So I think that's that's really awesome that you've figured out a way to use the Search Console da- data to help inform those decisions. And the other thing that this makes me think about is AI. What what role does artificial intelligence and machine learning play in this? Is it on the data side? Is it on the content development side? Where are you seeing the biggest influence, the biggest potential, or the biggest risk? Um, on ev- everywhere, basically. Yeah. I mean, we are seeing AI integrated into all of our processes as it, as it should be. I mean, these are incredible incredible tools and technologies that can help us create efficiencies in our workflow, increase the effectiveness at every step of our process from creation to distribution to analysis. Um, I've actually been tracking how much time I save every week by using AI. And last week I did three months worth of work in one week. It was work. I I like that. Right? (laughs) Who doesn't want that? (laughs) And a lot of it was work that I I just wouldn't have done because it was time prohibitive. We just don't have the resources to stick into, you know, doing that kind of data crunching or data aggregation. But these tools, you know, basically give you superpowers once you start figuring out how to use them to optimize your processes. Uh, One of the things that we've done that's been really helpful is we've created Uh, you know, custom GPTs of different audience personas using all the data that we have around those audiences. Mm. Now we're having those GPTs look at our content and help make recommendations about our content gaps or the layout or the flow. And it's helping us make editorial decisions about what new content we should be creating, figuring out how to redistribute our content. So we'll ask our potential Pat, the undergrad GPT, Where else would you go to find this information? Oh, you're going to go to TikTok to find it? Well, let's have have you help us write a script for TikTok with this information, with this content that would be interesting. And then we'll let one of our, you know, student interns create it, reread that in their own language and looking at performance data. It does an incredible job of, I mentioned Google Search Console. Our news center has like 200,000 words that it's ranking for. Way too much data for me to go through individually. But these tools, you can go through it and find keyword similarities and areas of opportunity and potential pillar pages. And it can just pull all that together in minutes. 
Are you able to do that just by asking questions like that? What what recommendations do you have for pillar pages on our website based on this data? Is that are you asking it sort of human normal language questions after you upload a data set and it's helping you form your content strategy? Sometimes that works. Um, yeah. I tend to use like a race prompt structure. So I give it a role. I tell it what I'm going to ask it. I give it context and data around that. And then I tell it to execute the prompt. So that's like the race prompt model. And that works really well for those kind of detailed, you know, more uh, big data sets, big data yeah. set prompts. So it knows it kind of has an expectation of what you're trying to get it to tell you and what audience you're trying to connect with and what your strategic goals are. But I mean, we have a lot of that already on our website, so we can just point it to a web page, yeah. you know, look at this web page for our strategic goals, look at this about page to understand what students we're trying to target, and then tell us what information we're, we're missing and what gaps we have in this data set. As the program chair of EduWeb Summit 2024, I'm thrilled to invite you to Philadelphia, July 9th through 11th. With an emphasis on actionable insights, we're offering free workshops, exceptional networking, and content for marketing, communications, advancement, enrollment, web, and digital professionals. All of it focused on relevance, ROI, collaboration, and our industry's unique challenges. Application podcast listeners receive $150 off with promo code ALLISON24. Very, very cool. I love the way you're thinking thinking about it. I, I feel like most conversations I have about AI are on the content development. And I just think there's so many other opportunities that happen way before that piece. But that's sort of where people are jumping to. But it, it feels short-sighted to me to jump right to help me write a script for this. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. I, it's so good at brainstorming and coming up with ideas and the more data you give it, the better ideas it's going to come up with. I keep thinking about other industries because, as you said, I mean, this goes all the way back. You mentioned Ben Franklin and, and John Deere. Other industries have been doing this forever. And some higher ed institutions, I think, have been doing this for a long time, too. So I don't want to discount that. But I also want to know about who's the shining star outside of higher ed? Who does this really well? Who can we be looking at? as examples out in the corporate world or other industries to help inspire our own industry. Yeah. And there's so, so many companies out there that are really doing an incredible job. One of the examples that we use all the time is Red Bull because they are really thinking about their content as media. It, I mean, we think of Red Bull as an energy drink company. But they're not really. They don't, they even outsource the production and distribution of the energy drink. They don't even do that. They are a media company. They mm -hmm. sell their media. They license their media. They have user generated content from around the world. Some of their advocates, you know, just make content for them without asking for anything. They just ask for, you know, sponsorship. And then some of them are actually paid by Red Bull as, you know, Red Bull team members or Red Bull influencers. But, you know, these are things that higher ed needs to start thinking about ways to leverage our content as an asset. And you look at, I mean, like Harvard Business Review, that is a subscription Yeah, that's model, such a great example. Yes. Right? And that is just content that was created it's through the institution. And we all have opportunities to do things like that and look for different ways to leverage our content. Cleveland Clinic did that. They are now, they started out with a, a team of three people 10 years ago doing content marketing and they had uh, a budget for their team. And now they have over a hundred people on their team and they are actually a revenue model for the institution. They generate a lot of revenue with the billion plus hits that they drive to their content every year. Yeah, I like that idea of shifting the mindset to operate like a media company. Yeah, absolutely. Because we have that in spades on our campuses. We have <laughs> experts, we have stories, we have content. And one of the things that we struggle with a lot of times is the content that our, part our faculty in particular, our experts on, 
it, it can be hard to translate to other audiences. Do you have any advice on that? Because there's so much of it there, right? Like it's being written for academic audiences, just tons and tons of journal articles and presentations given at academic conferences. Do you have any advice? Have you seen anyone who's been able to really translate that and use it for a content marketing purpose really well? Well, I think a lot of that comes at the very beginning at the editorial phase. So we had, you know, researchers and deans reaching out to us saying, here's a great story that needs to go on your news center. And it was, it was great content around research findings, but like you said, very technical, you know, a lot of jargon, very difficult to consume. And so you really have to stop right there and think about who's the audience for this? Who's going to be the most interested in this besides other researchers? I mean, yes. That's a, a great piece of content for other researchers, but there are research publications out there that are better places to put those very technical stories. So start thinking about if this is something that our potential students might be interested in, let's see if we can find some advocates, some student interns who are willing to share this story through the institutional you know, reels or TikToks and tell that in a consumable way. Here is what this new research that was just done, here's the impact that it might have on the world. And, you know, these are the things that are happening on our campus. So it's really thinking about reframing it in the language of the audience that you're trying to connect with. And for campuses that have students who are working on that research with faculty side by side, they would be great to have in the content because they can tell their story and the impact it's had on them and how it's benefited them. Even if we can't translate the really, truly technical stuff to a general audience, people are going to understand that impact, that personal impact. Yes, absolutely. And if you're, if you're a research institution that's trying to reach students who are interested in research, what better way to convince them other than telling them about all the opportunities that exist whether or not, you know, they're really interested in that specific type of research, they're interested in the broad category of having research opportunities. And then, you know, you can tell the stories from of alumni who have used that, leverage that experience to get good jobs. Yeah, I like I like how you're turning it to personal. You're yeah. turning it to something that's really human centered, which, which is nice. And that's what people remember. People remember how you make them feel through the content, right? They might not remember the specifics of that research, but they'll remember how that student felt and the confidence that they developed and and all that follows with that. So I want you to picture you're a higher ed marketer and you've done your brand marketing, you've done your performance marketing. So really what you've been focused on is your brand chapters, perhaps, you know, getting those messages out and you've been running ad campaigns for visiting campus or for applying to grad programs or or whatnot. And you're listening right now and you're thinking, okay, this is our next thing that we need to really strategize around. What steps should they take? What's the first thing they should do? Yeah. And we always tell people to, to start small. First, make sure you have a solid understanding of your primary institutional goals and strategies or your department or your school goals and strategies, and then figure out what audiences you need to best connect with to help you reach those goals. And then look for stories that are going to connect with your audience. And you may find stories at all different areas of your faculty, your staff, your students, but look for those stories that are going to connect with those audiences or be relatable to those audiences. Look for problems that those audiences are facing or questions that they have that you find in your data and figure out how to answer those or what personal stories you can tell that will connect them with the solutions to those problems. And then start with those stories. Figure out what channel you need to put those out on, who the messenger for those stories should be, and then how you're going to track performance of that. And then once you have a few case studies, a few examples of that working very well, that's when you go to leadership and say, this is what content marketing looks like. This is what we should be doing more of. Look at the results of this. Give us 18 months to work on this and refine this and do this at scale. And then you're going to start seeing those bigger results, those more impactful returns 
and you're going to get data to support the impact and effectiveness of your strategy. It's funny because we were talking about data and it sounds to me that that's really the starting place because you need to have your audience data, what you know about your audience. And that might take the form of a research study, but whatever it is that you have, you've got to start there and then everything works off of that. So I think about a college perhaps who has a research study that the top two things for their audience Let's say it's getting a good job and they want good teachers. From there, I can see how your process would work, how you would think about, okay, what's our best stories? What's our best content we can tell that illustrate those two things to our audience? And then it it just goes from there. Yeah, absolutely. And then you start thinking about, all right, whose stories are we telling? And can we get them to tell their stories? Are they going to connect with those audiences the best? Because maybe maybe when you're trying to showcase your faculty to potential undergraduate students, maybe it's not the faculty that tells those stories about themselves the best. Maybe it's the student. It's the student. That's right. And what yeah. value they got and how they connected and how that made them feel welcome and part of a community within this institution now you're starting to get to something that's going to connect with a high school student who's confused about where they want to go or what they want to study or you know now at least they'll know that there's good faculty there that they can connect with and that will help guide them and and give them that direction that they need that's interesting that you just talked about emotion a bit as i was thinking when you were going through sort of this idea of centering on institutional goals i was thinking to myself I wonder how you can fit in how you want your audience to feel because that might help form the content and also the type of content that you're choosing, right? Like I can see what you're describing, the example we're going with right now of a student telling their story of how a faculty member really made a difference for them. That feels like video to me. Doesn't that feel like video? It beca- It becomes really natural because I want I you need the student to feel that connectedness come through, that relationship come through. And I don't know how you could do that over text. So I was just thinking about how this is this is such an emotionally driven approach to marketing. Yeah, absolutely. And like you said, it's difficult to communicate that in text in like a story. Yeah. But if you could get that student to go into a a community platform and you know, represent your institution and share that, you know, as an ongoing story, as a conversation, as a discussion in this community platform, there's another way that you can deliver that same story in a different format, you know, but still targeting that very specific audience. And the nice thing about these stories is they don't have to be highly edited. They don't have to be super highly produced. It can be something, you know, just a casual video on social, or it can just be a conversation in a community, or you can, you know, do the full production um, and have it in a, you know, a, a reel that you feature on your website. So, so many different ways to deliver that same story and to leverage that content. You just have to make sure that you're matching the audience to the channel. And I'll add too, that's the student that is definitely on your panel at an accepted student's day. You know, it, it comes, it comes full circle there. there it's, and that gets back to the initial conversation we're having around what mistakes do we make? The mistake is we do one thing with it and we let it sit there and we don't, we don't think it through, through multiple platforms, multiple mediums and the number of times we need that story to get in front of our audience for it to even stay with them. Yeah, absolutely. And when you start thinking about your media, your content as an asset, then you remember that all this old content that you have that may have been high performing at one time, but has kind of, you know, fizzled out. Mm-hmm. All of that has value still. You can go back to those stories that were high performers and say, what is it about this story? What is it that connects with people? Can we do a refresh on that? Can we reuse this on another channel? We have this wealth of stories that we've already created, all this content we've already created. Let's figure out how to continue to leverage that and let's go back and refresh our high performers or look at a way to, you know, create a modern take on a story that we did 10 years ago, or here's an update, you know, and, and think about who the students were that we featured in that piece 
where are they now? Let's get them back into the you know story process and look at ways to make this a lifelong process for all of you know all of our students, alumni, faculty, staff. This is part of a community that we belong to. Let's share all those stories. I have one last question, and it's around if you're trying to build your team to be able to do content marketing or develop yourself to be a strong content marketer, what are some of those skills that you think are super valuable in this space? I think storytelling is a big one and being able to identify which stories connect to which strategies. If you're trying to wear a lot of hats and you're just one person doing everything, or if you're building a small team to do this, you really need some strengths in content strategy. So you really need to be able to understand how you're going to connect the story to your your goal, what you're trying to accomplish. And then you really need to be able to create that content and understand the value of storytelling and how you're going to communicate to that audience in a way that convinces them to eventually take some sort of action. And then you're also going to need some sort of analytics or monitoring. How are you measuring this? How are you making sure this is working? So if I was going to bring three people on to, you know, start a content marketing team, this is the way Cleveland Clinic started their content marketing team. They had a content strategist, they had a creator, and they had a SEO analytics person. So you need those three different parts to all come together, and then you can just build and scale from there. And if anyone happens to work in a marketing or communications program, I mean a major at a college or university, by the way, these are the skills that we need coming out of those programs. I find particularly the creator and the data side is lacking sometimes in the skills that are coming out of recent grads. So we need to also rethink the programs that are teaching our students these marketing skills because marketing is changing, it's shifting. We need them to have new approaches. And I'm going to add one more thing that I think goes across, cuts across all three of your roles, curiosity. And yep. uh, that is the number one thing when it comes to content marketing, because whether it's on the data and you're trying to figure out, well, hmm, why is that different than this? And you, but you have to go have that curiosity to see it and then dig in. But also on the strategy and the creation side, you, you've got to look for that in someone. I haven't yet found the perfect way to hire for curiosity, but uh, if anyone has ideas, please. Please send them my way because I think it's just such an important skill for marketing today because of how it changes so much. We have to be curious about that. Yes, absolutely. And and when you're talking to your audience, Anne Handley yeah. always says this, in everything that you create, you should always be going back and saying, so what? That's exactly what I mean about curious. It's understanding and wanting to know the so what is absolutely. just so key. Brian, thank you so much for sharing your insights. Will you tell everyone about the new book? Yes. So Epic Content Marketing for Higher Education should be coming out momentarily or or just has come out recently, depending on when this drops. And it's all about the basics and understanding of what content marketing is, how it can be leveraged in higher ed, and then goes all the way through to how you do it, how you implement it, what challenges it can overcome, and what you need to be thinking about to connect with your audiences. Thanks, everyone, for tuning in. Make sure you check out Brian's book. We'll have his LinkedIn and link to the book and everything like that right in the show notes so you can find them. And if you enjoyed this episode, please make sure to share with other colleagues you think might be interested and recommend it wherever you're listening. Have a good one. Hey, all Zach here from Enrollify. If you like this podcast, chances are you'll like other Enrollify shows too. Our podcast network is growing by the month, and we've got a plethora of marketing, admissions, and higher ed technology shows that are jam-packed with stories, ideas, and frameworks that are all designed to empower you to become a better higher ed professional. Our shows feature a selection of the industry's best as your hosts. Learn from Mickey Baines, Jeremy Tears, Jamie Hunt, Jamie Gleason, and many, many more. You can learn more about the Enrollify Podcast Network at podcasts.enrollify.org. Our shows help higher ed marketers and admissions professionals find their next big idea. Find yours at podcasts.enrollify.org.